Welcome back. So uh, we'll go back to uh, the materials and talk about I.O. in a moment. Just first uh, do some quick introduction. Um, so I'm Erna. Um, I work at Aalto University, so um, mostly familiar with the Triton cluster. Um, and yeah, I work there as a software engineer. So yeah. Hi, Simo. And, hi, my name is Simo. I'm also from Aalto. So the same stuff. Uh, and today we'll talk a bit about IO best practices or like IO in general. Yeah. So should we go just directly into the material? Yeah, let's do that. So I'll open this. <clears throat> so what we kind of really want to go into is just um, we, we want to give a, a model of how uh, input and output works and why it can be or when it can be a bottleneck um, for your program. So, um, well, let's just go into it because um, it, it's yeah. probably just better to show and show and tell rather than yeah. go through the uh, objectives here. Yeah. So, so compared to uh, CPU and RAM <clears throat> that was mentioned previously, I/O is a bit of this kind of like a like the eternal wallflower or like some, something that is not often discussed or it's not uh, so heavily uh, like it's not maintained by the Slurm. So so Slurm doesn't necessarily know about the I/O in in the same way that that memory and and CPUs are like. Reso they are really sources. So, so with the I/O, um, you need to be a bit more like conscious of what the program does underneath it. And and for this, we want to show first like what what is like file. <laughs> in let's start with that. What is a file in a Linux file system? And and file is is metadata <coughs> and file contents. And and this metadata here doesn't mean metadata as in like your data set has metadata with it, like your data, your data set describes what's in the data. It means like metadata as in like who owns the file, when was it last modified, how big is the file, and this kind of stuff. And then the file contents is the actual like byte data inside of it. So that that is like the metadata that you would think about when you write, let's say, explanation of what your data set has. Uh, but but the file system sees stuff like this. So the file system sees the metadata and the file contents. And when the metadata is accessed, this is done using these so-called stat calls. So they st uh, check the stats or the status of the file. And the file contents are uh, modified by opening so-called file descriptors. So So the file is opened. So if you're using like Python or whatever open, like language, you usually have something like open a file. And that is basically, it opens the file, it opens a file descriptor, and then you can do like read and write calls to the file that actually like take the data in and out of the file. So if we look at below, um, we, we can see that, for example, if you run like an ls-l, that doesn't actually look at anything inside the file. It will check, just check the metadata. It will check just show the permissions and ownerships of like who owns the files and list the lists the file metadata. And if you catenate the file with cat, uh, so you just print it to the terminal. That basically means that okay, open the file for read only, like file descriptor, read everything that is inside the file and print it out. Uh, into the standard output. So it will only access the file contents. And if you don't have access to the file or if you don't have permissions, then uh, it doesn't, you can't, cannot do it, but um, it, it will just try to access the file contents. And let's keep this as, as this kind of a, like a backdrop for what we're about to demo then. So we have a few <coughs> demos. So Jagna, do you want to um, describe the demos a bit? Yeah. So. Um... Like in the previous one, so these are demonstrations. So um, the intention um, is not that you follow along, but that um, 
but it's not that you type along, but just that you follow. Um, but there are instructions here, and uh, this is where the examples are. And uh, um, after each section, there's this expected results, which should tell you, um, or give you an idea of whether your result, uh, if you ran the code, is what um, what I was expecting when I wrote this. Um, so you can run them on your own, and you can see what happens. Um, that's useful to do if you are ahead at the moment, or if you want to do them later in the uh, exercise sessions. <clears throat> okay. So what is the motivation behind the data? What what is the in, in like the uh, yeah what what uh, yeah? So let's go into the actual example. So I'll just make this a little bit smaller so that we can see a terminal window here. Okay. Maybe not quite that small. And now um, I am actually in the folder with the examples. Why can't I type into this window? I guess I have broken connection. Um, good start. So uh, I guess it's the demo effect. Let's take a connection to the Triton cluster. Yeah, this is not working. OK. This is also so taking a while. Um, so fortunately, I did already run these commands on the cluster, and we have the expected results panels. Um, it would still, at the very least, be nice to run them locally. But can you think of a reason why I couldn't access Triton right now? Um, um, I don't know, but maybe I am on you weekend. have it them locally. <clears throat> I I do have the examples yeah. locally. It's just a very different disk system. It doesn't exactly demonstrate what we wanted to demonstrate. Yeah. Uh, well. This is a little bit annoying. It yeah, might okay. be that login is just slow. Yeah. Okay. It's also slow um, to me. If we. Um, okay. Well. Um, yeah. We can we... look at the files locally. Oh, here we are. Great. Yep. Yeah. Um, should I do source? Okay. Yep. So. Just that we can follow, you can more easily follow along with the commands. I'll do this. Um, so now when I type something here, okay, this is also not updating. Okay, mm -hmm. that's fine. So we'll, we'll yeah, just have this look... terminal now. That's fine. Yeah. Um, can you see the lowest line? Let me know if um, if the lowest line at the terminal is not visible. Can you make it a white background? I am not sure how to do that. Uh, right click, or uh, maybe it's too late to do it. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So I am in the folder with the examples, and the examples. I'm. Let's also activate the condo repository. Whoop. I had all of this prepared, <laughs> but this is how it works, right? Um, yeah. Uh, PS1 equals. Yeah. So in the okay. example data, uh, what what we have is like we have a code that just creates like a simple <clears throat> uh, example data set motivated by Argonos, yeah. like fitness. Yeah. So this is um, this is an example. It, it's a generated example, but it's relatively close to what I have seen in actual research project. Um, so, and I'm going to be doing things. Uh, in good ways and bad ways. And I don't think that anybody in the research project is actually doing them in such a bad ways. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. um, so uh, there is a script to create this data. Um, but let's just take a look. So there's this data folder. It includes activity data, um, which represents how much I have been moving, moving um, according to a fitness watch, for example, um, at a given time. So let's take a look at 2008 and 10 is the month, so October. Um, and it includes a lot of files. Well, it includes one file for each day of the month. Hmm. Um, let's look at 30. And let's actually cut it so we'll see yeah. the data. So um, the number here represents the activity level. Uh, the last number here, the other one represents hour, and this is actually the index, so it's actually the same as the hour. Yeah. Um, 
So for each hour, there is a number. It's a single number, it's an integer and we want to do some analysis on all of these numbers mm -hmm. so if you if you think about it there's a large number of files here actually i did the calculation so uh <clears throat> 7300 files it's not that bad it's just my data um but if when i actually start doing the research and i have the data for 200 people 500 people 1000 people that's a lot um so it, it can really become a bottleneck the, the number of files so let's yeah, go back though and for these yep. examples, like throughout these examples, we will get some numbers and you have to always think of these numbers like, okay, what are the scales like between the different things that we are doing? Like what, what happened? Like, what, like same with the other ones, MPI example, like what is the scaling speed when you increase the number of CPUs? Like we also have to think about scaling here. So think of these, like, let's think that each file, imagine that they are 10 gigabyte files or something like that. So then suddenly we have a huge number of huge amount of data uh, so then we can think about okay what are the savings that we would get if the files would be a lot bigger or the number yeah. of files would be a lot larger yeah if, if there's a, a yeah. like you could have a measurement per second um, of this activity yeah. level although I guess this particular level is really defined on a yeah. one minute interval but that would already be a lot more a text but of, of course it's not the only measurement you, you get a heart rate per second for example you get a lot of measurements uh, from a device like that um, and so you could have a much bigger file yeah. but you can also have a lot more of these really small files which yeah. also is a problem in its, on its own so so let's let's check like a typical yeah. io pattern or what what happened yeah so the first thing i in fact wrote and not just like as an example this is not just an example of um, something um, that I like purposely doing it in a bad way. Um, this is actually like the first thing I would write. Um, this read files to pi. So, um, so what maybe read I should actually display the file first. Um, yeah. So, so what it does um, in short is just read all the files in a for loop. We'll do a list all the files in the data folder. For each folder, list all of these files in there. So these are the CSV files. Open and read. So I'm actually doing in a it's a slightly better way than my uh, first idea would be. I'm reading the text content and putting it in a list, and then turning that into a CSV file, and then that into a pandas uh, data frame. Um, Probably the first thing I would do is actually turn it into a pandas data frame here, but that would take a lot of time. Yeah. Um, and actually it would kind of obscure the fact that it's reading a lot of uh, stuff because it would be <clears throat> not just reading, but also doing useless computation between every file. So yeah, we um, want to measure that's why I'm doing it that or way, demonstrate yeah. the reading. Yeah. So I'm doing it in a much better and faster way than my first idea actually would be, but that's, uh, partly to not obscure the fact that I'm really doing a lot of reads. Yeah. Okay. So, so let's now let's try... do this. Whoops. Yeah. Okay. So, so you, you this might actually notice does take a while. You might notice that there's like a, also like a strange looking command before the Python thing. And that is the command called trace, which is part of like Linux system tools uh, that can be used to trace so it can trace uh, different kinds of like operations that the programs might do and what it can do is that in this case we want to trace file descriptors <coughs> so basically whatever whenever files are being accessed or done and then we have this dash c there as well to produce like uh, overall results or summaries um, for the for the results. So we want to see what the Python program did. And what we get yeah. is something like this. Yeah, so I guess um, these are how many files, how many times a file was opened. That's 8,000, so roughly the number of files we have. Um, I guess, yeah. so this is asking for file information. Yeah. And, and looking for a specific have... place in the file. So, we, yeah, I are, mean, overall, lots of operations. Yes. So we can look from the different columns that on the left, we can see what took most of the time. So it was okay. the file opening that took most of the time and starting. So basically, 
figuring out who owns the file, are we allowed to access the file, this sort of stuff. That took the most of the time, and you can see how many like uh, microseconds it took um, per call, uh, or milliseconds, I don't know, like what what's the actual, like it doesn't really matter. I like, think it's percent, yeah, it's percent of yeah. the time, so yeah. it's not quite seconds. And then how many calls we have, and and what is the call at the right side? Like and the whole thing so took is, five seconds, by the way. Um, yeah. So so cool. if we if we think about what the program was inside the program, we had a for loop that opened files in a for loop. So for each file, it had to like open the file. It had to access the metadata and the actual data of the file, and it had to do it. And we can see that being reflected <clears> here <throat> in the output. So for each file, we did a lot of these open calls. And we did a lot of these uh, stat calls, and the files are really small. So what we basically did is that, like, we had to like, we had to do it for all file, and each of these operations was quite small, but they still have like a lot of latency with them. So let's like a normal, normally in this kind of a situation where you want to access all of the data once, like you just want to go through the data. A better solution is to usually bunch up the data. Uh, into an archive because then you don't have to like do these individual calls and it will speed up the code dramatically. So, so one question was uh, why did we have this many more uh, file opens than um, that we have files uh, or data files and the answer is that we are importing Python libraries which contain a lot of files dot uh, pi files and all sorts of different files. So yes. we will actually not get very close to zero at any point. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We don't, we will not so, get so to one. there's always going to be like a baseline, like a startup. Same with the like MPI programs. You have a certain like startup things that uh, you always have to calculate as a part of the whole thing. But yeah, but then you can like, but that's a fixed. When it... um, <clears throat> so when you increase the number of participants, um, the, that part will not increase. So it's yes. kind of, uh, yeah, yes. the fixed part of the so let's look time. at the archive okay. reading. So yeah, now we so. have this tar file. A tar file is, it's a single file, but it's essentially just uh, the contents of the files put in like right after each other. It's a very simple archive format. This is not even compressed. So it's just actually the full contents of the files with some little bit of metadata uh, in between. Do you want to show the, um, the Python code quickly? Yeah, um, it, it is relatively straightforward. Mm -hmm. um, well, so there is here... a difference between streaming mode and just read. Uh, we want to be streaming uh, because otherwise it will read the file multiple times. That's just this particular mm -hmm. tar opening library. Um, otherwise, yeah, we open the file once and then we get a list of, well, actually we don't get a list of members because what this is doing is actually it's reading through this list of files, like I said. So at the beginning, there's like a marker the file begins. Then there's the file name and some other information. This will actually contain the file name. Oh, mm -hmm. well, actually, yeah, this uh, member.name is the file name. Uh, we check that it's a CSV file from that. But then um, this extract file will just go on and read the chunk of data that is the actual file. Um, and yeah, then we, we read it and we append it again to this list of texts. Yeah, so, so you notice in the same like, way as before. You notice that in this for <clears> loop, <throat> like previously we had like before, we had a for loop over the folders and then we had a for loop over the files in the folder and then we opened each of them. And you might notice that over here, we have the open call at the outside of the for loops. So basically we open the tar file and then we go through the tar file, each file in there. So what we can expect from this is that, okay, like we probably have a less open calls. So maybe we should yeah. try it out. Um, before I do, um, just more for the audience than you, um, are you expecting, a, if we just don't count all of the Python library importing and that stuff, do you expect just one call to open the file and read? It is just one file. Um, let's see. So I don't know actually how I would answer that question uh, because there are the Python file reads, but the answer is not quite one. So that was faster. It actually did take two seconds. So two compared to five. Um, 
So like, it's still not trivial to uh, process the data and to actually like stream it from the file. But um, yeah. but we can notice that there's a, like a complete difference in the in the like what calls are now the most important ones. Yeah. So now, well, now we so notice that we have... most of the time was actually just reading the data. <clears throat> this is because like now it can just like go through the file <clears throat> and just read it from start to finish, like, and it can read it in bigger blocks. Uh, blocks. So so normally like it can read like like something like ten kilobytes at a time, whereas previously all of the files were like only like few hundred bytes or something. So so now it can read like multiple files at one time. From the file system, so the, there's less read calls. Previously, there were fifteen thousand. Now there's only two, two thousand five hundred, and there's much less file open calls. Yeah. Um. So, so yeah, in in practice, like if I wanted to answer the question, I just started with um, it would be the block size of the system. Um, so it would be able to read one entire block at a time, but the files are stored in blocks. So you you actually do need to read multiple times if there's a if the file is big enough. Uh, so at some point, if the files are big enough, um, you start actually accumulating the the read calls anyway. Um, but still, you don't you you only need to have one stat call for uh, one file. And there's <clears throat> uh, there's good questions in the chat. Like, can the tar file trick to used in file transfers as well and definitely like like yeah. combining multiple files like if you need to do a transfer between let's say your computer and the cluster and you need to transfer like 100 files for each file the transfer tool of your choice has to write the files write the metadata check the permissions whatever and and also like do the transfer through the network and it's it's much faster to just process one file of course, up to a point where like the file is so big that uh, like you might get into like uh, like it might just take too long to transfer one file and it might crash or something. But but that's up up, up to gigabytes. So so it's always faster until you reach those places. And also there was a good question, uh, like uh, can this be used with pickle objects, for example, in Python? Like, well, there's other data formats that do this kind of stuff as well. Like, we will talk mm. about this a bit that later, but this is just like a simple example. But there's other formats that you can use that <laughs> that store everything as one one file. And Pickle is one of them. Like, it, it will store yeah. stuff in one file instead of multiple files. So I guess if you have a large number of Pickle files storing different things, or like, well, um, then if you, so if you have a large number of files, you can use star, of course, to combine them into one. But of course, you, you could only create, potentially, you could create just one tar file. I guess so you can stream data into it if it doesn't fit in the memory, if you want to just make one big tar file. And, and remember <laughs> here that tar is like this example uses tar, but it can be other file format. But the main point is that what do you have the files? thousands of files yeah. there or do you have them combined in some format like it can so, be a math file it can be like a R data file it can be a pickle file it can be whatever but tar is something that people quite often use and that's easy to demonstrate so um there was one question how did i create the tar file um one reason i chose tar here is that it's available on essentially any like, unix posix file system it's a posix um utility so there is this tar command um if i look right yeah so you can use this command is it, uh, this is for reading yeah. this one is for creating the uh, yeah. tar file from the data so yeah. this command exists on any linux system but because of course i'm um I'm a perfectionist and I wanted to make sure that you can run this even without the tar command. Uh, there is also this create um, create archive. So if you want, you can also do this from Python. Yeah. Um, but another thing just um, on that, there is this web data set example at the end of the notes, which we'll clearly not get into. Uh, let's see. Um, but yeah, so mm -hmm. 
that use also uses the tar data format and has a nicer way of creating tar files um, and creating these yeah. uh, like sharded tar files that are like large, yeah. um, a large file with a lot of data, but still like multiple files so that you can read them in random order and all of that. So there, that's there a, a nice thing to look into. There was a good follow-up question there <clears throat> also that like does creating the tar file ah. just move the slowness of opening files to another script. And of course it does. Like but you first, in order to create the target file, you first need to open all of the files, right? Yeah, like you need to load yeah. all of the files and create the target file. But the thing is that like what accumulates, like like if you do it once, like pre-processing step, instead of having the individual files, you you collect them together, like you do it once so that you'd have to do it again. Uh <clears throat> like then you you can um, you can mitigate some of the like <laughs> some something you can like accumulate if you do it over and over again like let's say you want to do the same analysis with different kinds of parameters and you always access all of the files then suddenly you can do like i don't know a thousand times the the same io kind of a thing and yeah. that will like so if you're running the same thing many times then um it it is useful to do this tar command once, even though it of course takes some time. Um, and the other thing is if you're, um, if the whole data doesn't fit in the memory once, then you will probably end up reading it multiple times, even in a single run. Um, so this should be common in machine learning. Um, yeah. And then uh, using a good data format for reading is, is important. Let's, but let's uh, so, go to uh, like yeah. the next next example so so the next example is motivated by the machine learning world where, where basically quite often you want to load data in a random uh random way and in this target is usually not the best way unless you use something like the web data set mentioned by Yarna. uh because <laughs> like let's let's demonstrate what happens when you try to yeah. read the files i mean the random web data set kind of uses a trick in that it's not yeah. completely randomized um but yeah, so, so essentially, if you try to read random chunks from a file, that usually means you will um, you will open the file and then seek until you find the place. So like it's like running a tape. You go, you read through the file until you find the place that you actually want to read, um, and then you can read that chunk. And then you have to open the file again if it's uh, if the part you want to read is earlier. So random access is uh, not a great pattern for um, for reading files in general. Yes. So you can imagine what the Python, what the Python code looks like. I'm just randomizing the list of files here. So let's just run this. Um, <clears throat> this takes a little bit longer. So here we had 1.73 seconds, 2.8. So like not as bad as reading all the files. I ended up actually opening, um, here we open 580 times, read to 2,500. OK. Um, yeah, it, it, it had to open here. the same amount of, yeah, it had to open the same amount of files. But like uh, Jagna said, now it has to like seek the different location where it wants to read. So so because the archive is, is one file, it has to suddenly like seek the correct place in the archive and then read from there. So we get a lot more read calls because sometimes like when you read, you might re read a certain amount of data and you your data is somewhere in the middle of that <clears throat> like block of data that you want to read. And then you read more than you needed. <laughs> so you read, read basically just, you read more than you need and then you read that part and then you need to go somewhere else and you need to read again. Uh, so, so that's why we get a lot of C calls. It's still faster than the individual files, but it's, it's not good either. Yeah. So for these, there are tools like for random reads, you usually want to have the data in some way that you can load the data in a sequential order, like as a one block, but then randomize it in memory. So so instead of loading uh, the data from the disk in a random order, you want to load the data into memory and randomize it in memory. Because that is okay. A lot so um, I'll just show the example that comes next because that's the like, chunked random access. 
Um, so what we do here is um, this is um, a bit of a made up case in that the, the all of the um, data actually does fit in the memory. But let's just think that if uh, only 10 files fit in the memory at a time, and we want to have it like somewhat randomized, but not necessarily completely randomized, then um, we can extract the contents of 10 files. And then once we have 10 files, we random to take a random permutation of those 10 files. So it, it's somewhat random, but of course it that it's not reading completely randomly from the file. It's just randomizing each chunk. Uh, so this is commonly just good enough. Um, and you can also randomize the order of the chunks if you save them in separate files. Um, so that's um, that's a common yes, and is... way of doing it and works well. Yeah, this is what, uh, for example, the web data set uses that it, yeah. it loads, spreads the, if you have a big data set, the data set is split into multiple tar files uh, in a random, like random ways. And then each of those files is opened, read, and then the stuff is shuffled in memory. And because you roll, load the different tar files in random order, you basically get full randomness. So you don't have to ever like, you don't have to, uh, read individual files, you can still read one file. Now, um, let's see if the same thing happens as I saw previously. And then I can ask you if you can quickly say why it would happen. Um, yeah. So why is this faster than the just reading the whole archive in one go? <laughs> and so uh, significantly faster every time. Yeah. I, I, I think the the thing here is that uh, when you extract, like I would, well, I would guess that the, when you extract the files or read, you read multiple chunks into memory, uh, it can like optimize the code in a way that like it doesn't have to like, like it can just like pipe stuff into the, into the chunks. <laughs> like it can just, like it doesn't have to do intermediate processing for each chunk uh, one at a time, but it can do it for multiple at, at one time, but I'm, I'm not yeah. certain. Okay, maybe. Um, yeah, Python but, usually but, doesn't do a yeah. lot of. But uh, but then again, like uh, at no. this uh, this uh, like speeds, it's it can be random noise as well. Like it can be just random noise. Yeah, uh, but but I mean, this is happening every time. This is repeatable. Yeah. So I'm I'm just wondering. But okay, let's move on. Um, so one problem here is that the S trace output, like this, is relatively good, I think. But if mm -hmm. you have just um, if, if you try to get all of the file reads, for example, and do some proper profiling and not just get the comp, that's like a full sum in the end, um, it, it's not very readable. <clears throat> mm. So we haven't found great tools for reading it. Uh, I mean, this, I, I, I don't want to say that these are not great. It's great that somebody took the effort, that took the time to write this. Um, but, you know, there could be something something better maybe around uh but in any case these are what we found um and yeah it's great that people took the effort to write them um mm -hmm. yeah, yeah like those um, those tools can give you a bit more like information of what files were accessed and that sort of stuff which might be like if you don't know <clears> what your program is doing it might be good to try out these tools uh the straight the second one uh, has also like if you're running MPI programs and you want to like only you run trace on one of the tasks, so so you can just monitor one task, then that's that's pretty nice feature as well. Uh, but but the main thing that we want to come across is that like, this is what file access looks like, and and this is what the program tries to do, and and usually the best uh, like how could I say the best thing to do is to look at your program and see how it tries to access the files if you can like if you if it's not hidden inside the program but but to think about okay what files go into the program and what files come out of the program how many go in how many go out and what is the way that the program tries to interact with the file system because like then you can think about okay i can expect that let's say one file access will cause certain amounts of open calls and they might slow down the whole thing. And next, we could talk about a bit about why, like, why is this even a problem? Like, if you run on your own computer, you might have a, like a fast 
like an NVMe SSD or something like that. Why why is this even like a like a thing? Why are we talking about I/O and these file calls? And the reason is that yeah. all of the HPC clusters they usually have like a network file system, and we have a low stress file system. There might be other other file systems in other clusters, but usually it's some something similar to what we have. Uh, so so there is a network file system, and what happens when you try to access a file there? Because the program doesn't know, right? Like the program just thinks that, okay, there's a file system. I will try to do like a file system call. It will do the same calls, whether you do it on an SSD file system or a network file system. It will do the file opens and file writes and whatever. Uh, the, 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 like it doesn't care. It doesn't know what system answers those calls. So if we look... Um, Look at the, if you open the explanation, there is a diagram yeah. of an, of a typical file system, like a network file system. And, uh, and what, what they usually are like, like a loose file system, it's actually that there's multiple metadata servers that serve just the metadata. Uh, and there's usually like corresponding, or there's like object storage servers that actually store the data and, and whenever you are making a call like you you ask let's say i want to open this file there is usually a file system client that that basically sends those calls then to the right places so so when you try to access a file you will send a call to the metadata server that hey can i access this file and where actually is the file because i don't know like it the, where is the actual contents of the file then that response comes back to the client which then if the response is like, yes, you can access it, it will try to access the object storage server where it tries to access the actual file. And, and there, the data, it will have to like fetch the data from a disk where it like actually gets the data into, and then it will uh, send the data back. So you can think that, that there's like lots of overhead here. Instead of like, let's say your SSD in your computer, uh, like which is fast, but it's small and it's not redundant or anything like that that is needed in the high performance computing system. What happens is that instead of the data being right there in the SSD and the calls being served almost immediately, there's lots of network interactions. Like there, there has to be data transfer through the network back and forth, and um, this will call latency. And this will, then all of these individual calls become longer and longer and this means that while the and usually in the programs while the file system calls are being solved the program doesn't do anything like it doesn't continue there's some programs that do like asynchronous file calls that they do stuff on the background and this is of course good because then like it can continue working while the data is still being fetched but but that is more complicated to program so usually it's better to not not get the data, or if you get the data from the file system, like the shared file system, you get it in the right format, because then you can minimize these latencies that can slow down the program. Okay, so basically, um, like is the the reading speed, the bandwidth is, I guess, roughly the same as you would have on a laptop, or not that much slower, but there's a lot of latency for accessing the file through the network. And yes. also, while well, making the stat call, which is probably yeah. going to a different server. Yeah, the, the file systems yeah. are, of course, like very powerful. But the problem is that there's hundreds of users using them at the same time, right? And and there's yeah. like there's a lot of people in the network transferring like MPI stuff as well, and they can be congested, and 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 the data might just be like the disk is somewhere that it it needs to like fetch the disk, the data. From the disk so it's there's always going to be like these intermediate steps that take time so that's why you don't usually want to like waste waste time computing time to to do this kind of io so uh, calls so that's another thing that is i think good to bring up at uh, bring back at this point so because file systems are not or just like file access it's not something you schedule with slurm you don't it's not a parameter that you give the slurm and you 
submit your job. It's just a shared resource. So yeah. if you manage to slow it down, then you're slowing it down for everyone. Like you do have to do a lot to slow it down or multiple people need to be doing a good bit to slow it down. Um, but if you have a thousand copies of a job and they all read a bunch of files that can do some damage and then it will slow down for everyone. It's not just your job that is slowing down for. So that's an important yeah. thing to note. Um, what else do we want to cover in six minutes? Um, yeah. Well, there's this uh, typical file system speeds, but I guess the, the latency is really the, yeah. the big thing in this case. Because in the example we just did, um, it was all latency. Like uh, the, the speed of reading the file, the, the amount of, of data in the files was the same in each case. Mm. Um, and, and there was also like a good question in the in the chat about like data forms to use. And like you shouldn't, you should always remember that if you can access the files using like code, you can use like an intermediate data format. Like like while your code is like, let's say you have a, your original data is in like CSVs, like Yarnos data. Like you can still have the original data like that, but while you're working on the data, you can store it in a beta format, like, like a binary format or something like that and work on it. And then at the end, if you want to publish the results and you want to make it like as readable as possible, you can provide it in a different form. But during the processing when the computations are being done it's usually important to like convert it into like a good data format. so there's um one more workflow um i want to mention um in the last couple of minutes um a workflow thing so it's kind of a cheat of uh, how to get away from um from having to deal with luster which is if, if your cluster has local disks like triton has some sub nodes then it's a very good idea to move your data into the local disk. So by a local disk, I mean something that's actually attached to the compute node. It doesn't, you don't have to go through network to do any reading. And, and that is still probably shared with, any, with anyone else running on that same node. But um, yeah, you don't, you don't have to use the network file system, the shared file system. This is or... especially important for GPU jobs where you're doing yeah. like GPU machine learning or whatever. Usually those machines are bought with fast SSDs for this explicit reason, because they are so data hungry, the deep learning models uh, that you need to have the data locally or the GPU will idle. So, so it yeah. just cannot get enough data. So the local disks are very important when you're using, uh, doing like GPU jobs. Okay, and um, there are also these RAM disks. So any Linux system will have a dev slash shared memory. Um, and that's also a file system, but it's actually in RAM. So it's a really fast way of communicating. If you have a lot of RAM, you can put all of your data into it, but well, you need to reserve it when queuing the job. Um, and I mean, it is limited to RAM. So if your data doesn't fit into RAM, then there's no way you can use this to speed things up. Uh, but it is still like, it, it's good to to know about. It can make things a lot easier and faster. Yeah, for um, example, so if your program does like a lot of intermediate, small intermediate files, but it does them yeah. often or something like that, like putting them into the RAM disk is, might be a good option. Okay, so uh, we are really, well, we're getting right onto the lunch break. Uh, one minute to go. So, um, anything you want to say before we wrap up? Uh, we do have this web data set um, mm. example here, uh, which you can take a look at on your own. And uh, there are also other exercises, of course, um, in the exercise session coming up. Um, that's all. Um, then let's if, go to the lunch break. If we go to the notes, there is some feedback there. Uh, one minute while I switch. Okay, I've switched. Um, so for some other daily notes, if you're registered, there's this bring your own code session. You can come and ask us questions. Or no, it's an exercise session, isn't it? 
Well, I mean, you can we cut. Do have exercises, can, but also please do put your own code and ask your code. Basically, any kind of mentoring and individual follow up. Also, many and probably all of the partners you see listed on the website would be very happy to receive questions from about anything we discussed today. So go there, ask about how this applies to your cl cluster, ask for help in how to um, configure things, actually do it, all that stuff. So the stream will stop now, right? And we go only to Zoom after the lunch break. Isn't that correct? Yes, I think so. Think so. OK. <clears throat> So please fill in this feedback here. Let us know all that stuff and have a good lunch. See you later then. See you. Okay. Bye. Bye. See you.